Horror sequels, by a general rule of thumb, are not a good idea. Not content with the way they dispatched the villain at the end of the original, but very content with the amount of money they made from it, studios are more than willing to flick the switch and order a follow-up. Even the most highly regarded horror films have received a schlocky sequel, or at least a soft reboot that doesn't bother to up the ante, but simply wants to recapture the magic that made the first one so special. The Exorcist, widely regarded as one of the best horror films ever made, is no exception. William Friedkin's adaptation of William Peter Blatty's novel of the same name received a nomination for Best Picture and earned Blatty the Academy Award for the adapted screenplay of his book. Blatty's proposed script for a sequel was shelved amid struggles to find a director, instead leaving us with 1977's Exorcist II, The Heretic, with neither Friedkin nor Blatty involved. The sequel was a monumental failure with both critics and audiences, making a mockery of the earnest tone of its predecessor, and it quite rightly placed the franchise on life support. But 13 years later, Blatty's intended sequel, that had in the meantime been adapted into a novel, Legion, was released this time with Blatty himself returning to direct. Completely ignoring the second film in every way other than its title, The Exorcist 3 is a true return to the greatness of the first, in my opinion, but not in the sense of revisiting the story beats we know and love. Set 15 years after the original, the film exists in a bleak world, one nearly devoid of faith, devoid of good, while evil builds all around. Its central struggle is more than just of good versus evil. In a post-exorcist world, the devil isn't the only one to be cast out, God is too. It takes the theme of possession to another sadistic level, and even reflects it in the circumstances of its production. The first film introduces us to Father Karras, a Jesuit priest struggling with his faith, who is called upon by actress Chris McNeil to help her daughter Reagan, who she's convinced is possessed by a demon. While Karras reluctantly investigates, Veteran detective Bill Kinderman inquires into the death of a director, last seen with Reagan. Burke Dennings, good father, was found at the bottom of those steps leading to M Street with his head turned completely around, facing backwards. The two men's investigations naturally overlap, and they strike up a bond. Their friendship, heavily abridged in the film adaptation, is tragically cut short when, in the process of exercising the demon from Reagan, Karras offers himself as a host to free the girl from the spirit, Take me! Take me! making the ultimate sacrifice as he too plummets to his death, putting an end to the demonic happenings of the McNeil family, and thus redeeming himself and his faith. In Karras' sacrifice, we can see a very clear parallel with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Despite its shocking reputation as a work of transgressive fiction, Blatty's story is nevertheless a Christian one, with his Catholic upbringing and ties with the Jesuit Georgetown University clearly influencing his work. Chris McNeil is converted by the end of the film, her mistrust in science being replaced by a newfound faith, and Karras lives on in the relationship between Detective Kinderman and Father Dyer, Karras' friend and confidant. But when we pick things up in Exorcist 3, all isn't well. Bill Kinderman, now recast with the legendary George C. Scott taking over the role from Lee J. Cobb, is still mourning the loss of his friend Karis, while also struggling with bigoted colleagues, an irritating in-law, and an oppressive atmosphere in Georgetown, developing with an alarming new series of murders. The one thing keeping him sane seems to be Father Dyer, played here by Ed Flanders, in what I think is one of the warmest performances of all time. You're going alone or with the usual keepers? I'm taking Bill Kinderman with me. The cop? Yeah, every, uh, every year on this day he gets depressed, so I, I try to cheer him up. Unlike Karras, Dyer's faith is strong and integrated into his personality. He may not be an overtly pious character, but he represents genuine human and religious good. Bill, it all works out right. When? At the end of time. That soon. Kinderman, on the other hand, rejects God in light of the suffering he sees around him, in the classical sense of the Epicurean dilemma. Would a God who is good invent something like death? Plainly speaking, it's a lousy idea. It's not popular, Father. It's not a winner. There you go, blaming God. Who should I blame? Phil Rizzuto? In the meantime, we have cancer and mongoloid babies and murderers, monsters prowling the planet, even prowling this neighborhood, Father. Right now, while our children suffer. As with the first film, the existence of God is a prominent theme here. 
but its manifestation in Exorcist 3 takes a more challenging form. The first murder of a young black boy who Kenderman knew through the police boys club appears to have been racially motivated, an act of very human evil. The killer drove an ingot into each of his eyes and cut off his head. In place of his head was the head from a statue of Christ, all done up in blackface, like a minstrel show, you know. The genius thing about Exorcist 3 is we never see these killings take place. <laughs> Rather, the suggestion employed through camera work, editing and dialogue makes it seem like the very scenery itself is hostile towards our main characters. More deaths occur, including that of a priest, a nurse in one of the most effective jump scares of all horror cinema, and tragically, Father Dyer. In killing two priests early on in the film, Blatty isolates us from the once dependable security of the church, leaving us and Kinderman to deal with this evil alone. Dyer's death is revealed to us in the form of a dream that Kinderman has of the afterlife. Compared with the first film's minimalist dream sequence, in which Karis witnesses his mother descending into a hellish subway station, this scene ventures further into the absurd, presenting us with a clinically shot vision of heaven, more akin to a hospital or airport terminal than a place of eternal rest. The angels seem like parodies, as if representing Kinderman's scepticism of religion, and their lack of visible emotion serves to further distance us from a comforting impression of the divine. You know, I wonder if both of us are dreaming this. No, Bill. I'm not dreaming. Without Dyer, and by extension God, Kinderman is on his own. But what he does have is a string of clues leading him towards an unlikely conclusion. Each murder has been committed in the manner of a notorious serial killer, who was executed 15 years before on the same night that Karras died. Have you ever heard of the Gemini killer? Hell, have I what? He said. Yes, of course I've heard of him, so what? In this case, gentlemen, three decapitations, three victims, with this finger severed, the correct one, and the sign of the Gemini here. Two different people committed these murders? The victims' names always starting with K. Which increases the tension for the viewer as we unconsciously register Kinderman's own endangerment as part of this pattern. At the same time, the Georgetown Hospital psychiatric ward notes the sudden revival of a corpse-like man they picked off the street several years ago. Kinderman goes to see the so-called Patient X and recognises him as none other than his deceased friend, Father Karras. But it's not Karras speaking. Are they calling these Gemini killings in the papers? You must get them to do that, Lieutenant. It's important. The Gemini is dead. No, I am not! I'm alive! I go on! I breathe! At the moment of his death, Karras' body, still containing the demonic spirit Pazuzu, was invaded by the newly released soul of the Gemini killer, who has been transformed by the demon into a being of pure supernatural evil, sharing control over the priest's decaying body. Yes, about this body of mine. Friend of yours. Well, there I was, so awfully dead in that electric chair. I didn't like it. Would you? It's upsetting. There was still so much killing to do, and there I was, in the void, without a body. But then along came, well, you know, my friend. One of them, those others, there, the cruel ones, the master. In addition, he gains the power to transfer his soul into multiple people in the hospital, whom he uses to commit the different murders. How do you get out of here? Mm -hmm. Old friends, old friends, traveling man, one who moves. Here we see a perversion of Karras' Christ-like sacrifice. He is resurrected over a slow process of many years, but so too is the evil from the first film, as well as the worldly evil of the Gemini Killer. The main thing is the torment of your friend, Father Karras, as he watches while I rip and cut and mutilate the innocent, his friends, and again, and again, and on and on. He is inside with us! He will never get away! His pain won't end! The 
multiple spirits inhabiting Charis resemble the Gerasene demoniac from the Bible. In the story, Jesus comes across a man wildly raving with supernatural strength. And Jesus said to the man who was possessed, What is your name? And he answered, Legion, for we are many. The situation is resolved by Jesus performing an exorcism, driving the spirits into a herd of swine that then fall into a stream and drown. It's not unlike the sacrifice Karis voluntarily made in the first film, but by blurring the lines between Karis as a Christ figure and Karis as a disposable vessel for the demonic, Blatty presents the modern world as a space where biblical stories are distorted and no longer applicable. The hybrid nature of the villain is arguably the film's most crucial feature, and not just because it gives us two brilliant performances by Brad Dourif and Jason Miller. Compared with other horror sequels featuring a returning villain, Exorcist 3 doesn't undermine the struggle of its predecessor. We're just going to ignore Exorcist 2. The supernatural evil was defeated through Karis' sacrifice, but its return was facilitated by the spirit of human evil. The Gemini Killer is an antichrist in a way, serving an antithetical purpose to Jesus, whose resurrection is intended to encourage belief and thus give eternal life. The Gemini Killer, in association with his demonic master, forces Kinderman into a state of resolution, not of good in the world, but of evil. Yes, I believe. I believe in death. I believe in disease. I believe in injustice and inhumanity and torture and anger and hate. I believe in murder. I believe in pain. I believe in cruelty and infidelity. And in every crawling, putrid thing, every possible ugliness and corruption, you son of a bitch! I believe! In you. It's not because of his belief in God that he can vanquish evil, but because of his belief in evil itself. To draw a comparison to Seven, in my opinion, an inferior film, Kinderman holds a similar attitude to Morgan Freeman's Detective Somerset. Ernest Hemingway once wrote, The world is a fine place and worth fighting for. I agree with the second part. Despite the strong philosophical statements the film makes, there's nevertheless an underlying paradox and tension at work, and it comes from the very fact of its being an exorcist film. Blatty produced the film as Legion, downplaying its connections to the exorcist. While Kinderman needed to be recast in light of the original actor's death, Brad Dourif was chosen to play Father Karras, and not just the embodiment of the spirit of the Gemini killer, therefore making the film less of a direct sequel and more of a standalone project. Originally, the film was to end with Kinderman simply shooting the possessed Karras, freeing his friend in an incredibly bleak, mundane way. This way to end the narrative complements the godless world of the film, having to make do with the embittered hero of Kinderman to dispatch the villain. What we actually ended up with, however, is a more complicated affair. Upon realising the divergent nature of Blatty's standalone sequel, the studio ordered extensive reshoots to bring it in line with the previous films, notably bringing back Jason Miller to reprise his role as Karras, whilst keeping Durif as the voice of the Gemini Killer. Look at me, and tell me what you see! I see a man who looks like Damien Karras. If you looked with the eyes of faith, you'd see me. The main element they added was the titular exorcist, in the form of Father Morning, whom I've avoided mentioning purely because he basically has nothing to do with the film's plot with one introductory scene serving to prepare us for the bombastic finale, the exorcism itself. The strange thing is, I personally find this the much stronger ending, if for no other reason than it being a moment for the audience to release the tension built up over the previous acts. It goes completely overboard with special effects. Reportedly, George C. Scott, who'd only signed on to the film originally on the condition that it avoided genre tropes, said it would be a waste if Madonna didn't show up. It somewhat detracts from the true horror of the Gemini Killer's human evil, what saves it from thematically destroying the film, however, is its refusal to let the priest save the day. Ultimately, it's still our flawed detective that has to pull the trigger, regardless of any last minute divine intervention. Kill now! Shoot now! Kill me now! 
a director's cut labelled Legion has since been assembled using old VHS copies of the discarded footage, but I still hold that the theatrical cut, tonally inconsistent as it is by way of its jarring final battle, is still the more interesting film. Ironically, the studio's intervention brings the underlying tension between contrasting moral perspectives, those of Karras' good versus the demon and Gemini Killer's hybrid evil, right up to the surface, and weaves it into the very fabric of the film itself. What we're left with is not simply a bleak post-god thriller, or a straightforward conflict between good and evil, but a work of ambivalences, where contrasting influences, those of author, director and studio, struggle with one another over control of the body, whether it be Karras's or the films. In the end, I think it's an incredibly effective and interesting film that sort of sits between genres and can't quite be pinned down. Its title definitely does it a disservice in comparing it to the previous highs and lows of the franchise, with this mix of expectations leading to an underwhelming reception upon release. Whatever you think about horror sequels though, this one's worth watching as a continuation of Blatty's vision and doesn't detract from the success of the first film.